Okay. Good morning, my brothers and sisters all around this fragile blue planet. This is Dave from a hole in the ground called the Wolf Den Studio saying welcome once again to Wolf Spirit Radio and uh, let me see which show is this. Oh, Abstract Illusion Radio with our your host and my friend Jennifer Hillman and her wonderful guest this morning, Adam Leipzig. Good morning, everyone, and yes, Adam Leipzig is here, and he has an amazing resume. He has been in the film industry for, we'll ask him how many years, if he wants to say. But right now, he is really helping a lot of creative people get their stuff out there in the, the jungles of the film industry. He was formal president of the National Geographic Films. He's vice, senior vice president of Walt Disney Studios also, and now he is the CEO of Entertainment Media Partners. Welcome, Adam, again. It's been really an honor to even have any contact with you because really, I've really loved your films. Thank you You're so welcome. much, Jennifer. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, good morning. Um, good to be here with you today. Um, so some of the things that I've been seeing is you really want to help creative people make a living with their passion and through their passion. Um, what was it that kind of clued you in that that was really something that you wanted to do or there was a need to help artists in that way? Well, boy, that's a that's a great and a very big question. I'm a producer. I've been a producer for my whole career. I've been in the movie business for about 25 years, and before that I was in theater. What a producer does, essentially, is create an environment where artists can do their best work. The environment has to have the right collaborators, the right resources, the right tools, the right money, the right access to audience the right distribution, all those things. So being part of that process of um, being the midwife, if you will, for artists and creating the opportunities for artists to express themselves well in a way that's effective, that allows them to achieve their visions and also achieve a sustainable living and achieve connection with the audiences whom they're trying to reach is something that I've been doing for many years. I've done that in companies and as an independent producer. And a couple of years ago when I left National Geographic Films, I took a look around the uh, the world. I took a look at our country, which was then in the midst of our um, uh, deep, deep recession. And I said, <clears throat> you know, the jobs have all been outsourced. The economy mm -hmm. is struggling. We're still struggling now, by the way. Uh, the You know, the recovery is touching a few lives and it's not touching many lives but one thing that cannot be outsourced is creativity we have to find ways to support creative people because the only way that we are going to improve our laws and the law of others is by creating our way out of it um totally agree with you in fact i have a nephew that's in the film industry and his job um was outsourced. They moved the entire company. Originally, they were going to, they sent some of their people over to India to train them to basically replace these people. Mm -hmm. And they eventually just moved it to Florida. But within a couple of months, that company went under. Right. Um, so, and in the film industry, they're really doing their best to help the creative energies, but there is a lot of loopholes and a lot of things because of the expense um, in the creative inventions right now that it makes it difficult for people to really get the funding to do it properly. Don't you think? It, it, yeah, listen, finding money, getting financing is always difficult. And Jennifer, it's even difficult at the studio level to get movies greenlit and through the through the committees, through the levels of approvals, and through the system. Uh, at the studio level, it's difficult because we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars. Those decisions are taken with a lot of thought and circumspection and uh, a lot of analysis. 
And at the independent level, it's difficult because there, every independent filmmaker kind of has to reinvent the wheel for themselves, which mm -hmm. is always difficult. But, you know, my experience is that there is... There, most people who make independent movies never get their movies seen or distributed in any way whatsoever, not even on Netflix. 95% of the independent films that get made just don't get seen. And that, uh, that ticks me off. It frustrates me because it's so hard to make a movie. It takes so many years of people's lives to get a movie made. And for, it to, for a film to be made and not even have a chance to get in front of an audience in any form uh, just feels devastating. So I have two missions right now uh, in the film, uh, in, in the film and media universe. One is to help filmmakers make better choices and make better movies, movies that have a much greater likelihood of getting seen, getting distribution, and then helping investors, people who will invest in film and media projects, make wiser investment decisions so they invest in the movies that have the greatest chance of reaching audiences. Um, you were speaking about independent um, filmmakers, and I do want to mention you do have a book out there, um, which is Inside Track for Independent Filmmakers, which really I looked over the, a little bit of it, and it really is a wonderful guide actually not just for filmmakers, though it is based on that, for creative people, because it does give you an outline of what to look for. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, thanks for picking up on the fact that, that the book uh, is really useful for people who are not just filmmakers. The, the purpose of the book is to teach uh, filmmakers not how not how to make their movies because filmmakers know how to make their movies already they went to school or they've been practicing since they were six years old but the purpose of the book is to solve the two biggest problems that filmmakers have which is how do i get my movie made not how do i make it how do i get it made and if i've got it made how do i get it seen so the book is divided into two halves it shares content from a financier's point of view or from a distributor's point of view. And I'm really trying to share the way financiers and distributors think with filmmakers. So filmmakers can turn their brains 360 degrees and start thinking like financiers and distributors so you can talk in their language. Um, I've had, an ex I've had, uh, I've had a, a great career. I've had the opportunity to be a financier and a distributor. And I know how to speak that language and think the way financiers and distributors think because I've, I've been able to do that for the, in the past many years. So I'm sharing that information with filmmakers in this book. And you're right. People who are uh, doing any kind of creative activity benefit from thinking about those two questions. How will I get the resources for my project? And how will I get the customers or the audience for my project? How do I get it in the hands or in front of the eyes of the people I'm trying to serve? Yeah, uh, earlier um, last month, actually, I had um, a woman, the creative director for the Tucson Film Festival on mm -hmm. and She, we went over the kind of like the formula in a way and things for the artists to think about filmmakers in as as someone I'm a writer more than in films though I've dealt with films as, as well it's the same process to get your book if you can't find a distributor for your book you're screwed <laughs> so it's it's really there's a process in in the different ways of marketing and finding the funding and stuff mm -hmm. so I really appreciate the way you had it laid out because it was really common sense easy to follow and it made it very easy for the creative person to see the business side because I've worked with a lot of artists myself at being an artist myself and the one thing they hate doing is the business aspect right. they just want to be creative they don't want to worry about the money section and yet you have to yeah yeah you have to and it's a, you know it, it's a hard thing for uh, artists and creative people first I think because uh, they have a um, they have a mental block against it. It's really not that hard. None of us were born understanding money. Uh, we all had to learn how to do it. So it's just something that creative people 
need to get some exposure to and some training on and, and get familiar with. And once you break through that door of unfamiliarity, then it's really not so scary. I, I find also that the other frightening thing for creative people so much of the time is selling what they do. You know, mm -hmm. marketing themselves, promoting themselves, which we all have to do. We don't do it because it's scary and because we don't really like to be sold to. We feel that it's selling out or we feel that it is, um, uh, that it's uh, slimy or sleazy or artificial and not what we want to be known for. Yet, if we start thinking about what we're doing as important, and important to offer to people, not to sell them, not to convince them to do something they don't want to do, but just to offer it to them so they know it's there, so they can have access to it if they want. It allows us to sh shift the way we think about promoting ourselves and our work to a much more positive framework. And, and I, I agree with you. It, it's that aspect of um, selling your product. I mean, I... I'm not the best at doing it, but I'm great at helping other artists sell their stuff. If I believe in it, I'm right there for them, and I will get them the connections, and I will help them get it out there the best I can. Have no problem doing it for myself. Try again, Jen. Um, it's it's one of those yeah. things I can do it for somebody else, but not so easy for me. Right. Um, so I totally agree with what you're saying, and I'm working on it, um, but it's... And you know, and, and then, you know, sorry to interrupt, but, you know, you also just talked about another great way for people to help each other is to do it for each other, is that you can trade. It's often, it's really much easier to talk about somebody else's work than your own, isn't it? So if, if you found if you found somebody whose work you admired and who also admired your work, you could, in, in, a, sense, uh, in, a, in a sense, barter services and help each other market each other's work. That's also been a very powerful way that many creative people have been able to take a step forward. So networking is great. And, and one reason why I have this radio show, and it really is based on supporting the creative process, which to me is a very spiritual process as well. I think they're, they're interchangeable. So that's what this is all about, is helping the artists get their stuff out there. And if I can give them an hour, so be it. So okay. I really wanted to get you on here because you've got some great, things out there. Now, I noticed that you were having a work shop. Um, I d yes. I, you know, I have a number of workshops or uh, seminars or other things. I just actually did a workshop for filmmakers in Paris a couple of weeks ago for the European Independent Film Festival. Uh, we had about 200 people in the workshop and we had a great time. And I also do seminars, telephone seminars, where people can dial in and I bring in a, an expert in various areas and we talk about things and, and we share a lot of training and that's available on my website, which is adamleipzig.com and I'm going to spell that because people don't always spell it right. Uh, it's A-D-A-M-L-E-I-P-Z-I-G dot com. We just did one on marketing and self-promotion, kind of relevant to what uh, uh, we were just talking about Jennifer, um, mm -hmm. and we've done them on getting your books published. We've done them on finding access to nonprofit sources of money, on social media, on a variety of things. And we do about six of those a year. The, it sounds tremendous and awesome. And the thing that I liked, it wasn't overly expensive. It was very reasonable. No. It was no, actually we... pretty, very in inexpensive. Yeah, in fact, if people sign up on my mailing list, um, they get a discount coupon, and some of these are like ten bucks. So it's it, and I'll tell you the the information that's it's like ninety minutes to two hours of information, which is all sorted and curated and very specific, tactical, actionable things that people can get takeaways right away and put them to use immediately after the seminar. I think it's been a great investment for people. We've gotten terrific feedback from them. Um, and people keep coming back for more, which is the greatest evidence that we're serving our community well. Um, like I said, you're, you're multifaceted. You also um, are the, the uh, publisher of Cultural Weekly. And, yeah. and 
amazing information on there. It's like you could spend all day reading all the articles on there. So I yes. thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little distracting when you're trying to get work done, when you, you know, but it's, it's well, a good little break. So that, I appreciate that's we, that. That's why we do it only once a week because we don't want to distract people too much. Cultural Weekly is terrific, and for your listeners, that's at culturalweekly.com. It's, an, it's a digital magazine where every week we bring you six, seven, eight articles and a couple of videos, and often we'll, we'll spot a, new, a music video from a new artist or an emerging artist or an artist who's making a comeback whom we really like. It is, it's not comprehensive. It's not like every event that's taking place in Los Angeles or New York or Chicago. It's highly hyper-curated, often based on suggestions and contributions by our readership who are creative people and writers themselves. So we have a good mix of things, and it helps people keep abreast of what's going on culturally. We run a poem every week. We have a massive following of poets and people who love poetry, which is kind of remarkable. I'll tell you something kind of kind of great, Jennifer. Uh, one of the ways that you measure how much people are enjoying a digital publication is by how engaged they are, how many comments they make on mm -hmm. the articles. And the article that has the greatest number of comments on our magazine is a poem, which has now something like 180 comments. That's a gigantic number. It's more, way more comments than an article on Huffington Post gets. And to, 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 to be here today with you and your listeners and say, there are people, nearly 200 people, who will take the time to comment on a poem in America in the year 2013 gives us all great hope. Oh, yes, especially as me as a poet. Because that's my mm. main form of of writing. Um, I have a poetry blog, so it's like I love poetry, and I think mm. it's an art form that is healing and understanding, and it captures moments. It's a beautiful art form that um, I think is coming back, and you just confirmed it truly is. Um, yes, it is so true. It's really coming back, and it's it's amazing that it's hard to find a distributor though for a book of poems mm -hmm. because generally poetry doesn't sell well jennifer you should be may i suggest be an entrepreneur distribute it yourself i i would anyway um <laughs> yeah. I, I, it, it but still you need a distributor and that's difficult to find a distributor Unless you, I mean, there is a lot of different ways. You can go to Amazon and you can do, you, there's ways of getting it out there. But if you want it in the bookstores and stuff, finding a distributor to actually put it in the bookstores, even though they're fading out, um, it's, it's, it's difficult for poetry. Yes, it is. Uh, you, know, I've, uh, you know, we have done seminars on publication and, and getting your book out there. Uh, I have become a strong advocate for writers. Do you mind if we talk about this for a little bit? Please. Okay. Yeah, no, I've become fine. a strong ad advocate for, for writers to uh, not wait for the gatekeepers, not wait for the six publishing houses to say yes or no, and go ahead and publish the books themselves mm -hmm. and get it out there themselves. Most book sales don't actually happen in bookstores anymore. Most of them happen online, and especially mm -hmm. when you do events. And, and having conversations with uh, novelists and poets who are members of the community that we serve, uh, they tell me that they sell most of their books when they do readings, and people line up and buy copies of the book right there. And these are poets who, some of them are published by big uh, publishers, Mm -hmm. Many of them have distribution in the few remaining bookstores that we have in this country, but they say that they get the biggest sales when they do personal appearances. So you may find that you could go ahead and publish your book and book readings for yourself and sell your books and reach your audience that way. Uh, yeah. I also have ex examples of people in our community who are writers who began by publishing their books themselves they hit some certain num they hit they hit enough sales, 
And then a publisher, a major publisher, took notice and picked it up and gave it its second and, and that is, wider distribution. And that is the, the, the trend these days in publishing <clears throat> is, sub, you know, do your, your self-publishing, build up your audience, and then the publishers may notice. Um, right. because you need to build up your audience. In fact, that in music, I used to do promotions for a local band here. And they, they we actually got some scouts, and the scouts said, you got to have your own audience before we, we'd sign them. And it's right. like they're a great band and stuff, and we actually had a couple people wanted to sign them, and then the lead singer got nervous and quit. Of course. Mm -hmm. Um but it, you have to have your own following these days before the heavy hitters, as you will call them, um, will really take notice. Hey, that's true, not not just for books, not just for music, for everything. You mm -hmm. have to have your own following. You have to have your platform of people that you can reach out to. Uh, and of course, now social media is one of the great tools, probably the great tool that allows you to build your platform and have people follow you. I think it's our salvation that we can reach so many people so quickly and really for free. Yeah, and it's it's great way of networking, meeting people, and you know, being able to meet people to have those local events around the country, mm -hmm. around the world. You have some place you can meet somebody, talk to them. You might have a place to stay then, and they'll help you set up the whole event for you on their side of it, mm -hmm. which is exactly. just awesome. It makes it so much easier um, for so much. Now, the other thing about independence is um, what kind of vibe are you getting these days on what is – the film industry is taking responsibility on what they're putting out. Do you understand the question? Uh, at, ask me a little, uh, ask me a little clearer? More detail so I know which direction you're going. Okay. Um, basically, there's a, there's a lot, probably the most popular form of films right now is probably the horror film or the very intense, scary film, Blood and Guts. Mm -hmm. or almost like a political statement of some kind. Though there are some comedies in there as well. Do you think that the film industry is really looking and seeing what is going on in society? Or do you think they just look, well, this genre is, makes a lot of money, so we'll just throw it, we'll just do another one of those? Uh, the thing about the movie business is that it's business. Uh, having having worked at studios and having worked with all but one of the studios, I think at this point in my career, um, the, the people who run studios, studio executives, I find very smart, very intelligent, um, both aware and self-aware. Certainly have a sense of social responsibility, yet have the greatest sense uh, sensitivity to the marketplace and mm -hmm. to the box office and to their shareholders their job is to put out content that makes money and turns a profit without a doubt yeah and um, that actually is in any genre not just film in any genre of content whatsoever of course we you know people who are in media now are in all kinds of media so we, you know we make movies we make television we make uh, internet content uh, right. which we which is called nonlinear everything else is linear content so we use those words now uh, linear TV and movies nonlinear is what you find on, on online and yeah it's you know it, 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 it is it is a business and, and it's a tough business as you know Jennifer it's it, it's tough to operate within the business in a way that you make movies that you really care about and make good movies. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, no one starts trying to make a bad movie. Every one of us, every time we make, we make, you know, we're, think we're going to make a good movie, and sometimes it works out, and sometimes it doesn't. There's a lot of factors that no into the single individual controls. I've been very fortunate in my career to work with amazing people and be able to make some really terrific movies that I'm incredibly proud of and I think have stood and, st and will stand the test of time. But then I've also made some movies that um, have gone down to ignoble defeat. 
um, at the box office and critically. So I've seen all the sides. You know, it's really tough when you pull the trigger on a movie as a financier or when you're running a studio. You're deciding to do something, and you're not going to know how it's going to turn out or if it's going to work financially for about two years. So you're really predicting what's going to be the mood of the audience, what we want two years from now. Very interesting kind of future forecasting, trend spotting position to be in when you're rolling tens or hundreds of millions of dollars on the roulette wheel uh, every time you do it. It, it truly is, um, and it's it's just such huge numbers too for that roulette kind of the bet on the table. Um, right. You know, and so, there are certainly certainly kinds certain kinds of genres that just seem to do very well both internationally and in the U.S. Horror movies and action movies are probably the two biggest mm-hmm. um, two biggest ones, and also family movies. Big Disney style family movies like Oz the Great and Powerful, for example. Right. Uh, which I think is probably the highest grossing movie so far in 2013. That travels internationally very well. Remember also that about 70% of the movie um, box office comes from outside of the United States. Only about 30% comes from inside the United States. So when people make movies, we're really thinking about the world audience, not just the U.S. audience. And, and these days with the Internet, you have to think of the world audience because it's mm-hmm. so easy to connect. As you said, you went to the, the Paris Film Festival and did a, a workshop there. And it's it's very interesting. I find myself um, really wanting to understand the cultures in the different parts of the world so I can um, not necessarily adjust my work towards them, but find that universal message that goes around the world to yeah. um, really help people and connect with people. And that's something that I think a lot of artists are realizing they need to do. And it simplifies the the formula in a lot of ways. Uh, and tell me a little bit com- more about that. How does that work? Um, basically... One thing that everybody can understand is making a living mm-hmm. or um, a relationship, good, bad, and ugly of relationships, connecting to another human being, um, understanding the passion you have uh, for doing what you do, and looking for that other person to say, hey, you're good, or right. that international um, flavor of we're all one. We're all people. We all make mistakes. We all are good at what we do. We're all unique, beautiful people that have something to say. And for me, one thing that I try and do is allow that person to say, to find that voice, that vision, and help them express it. That's one of my greatest joys, is to help somebody do that. Mm-hmm. Um and it's it's interesting. I connected with someone in France, and they needed help with something um, translated in English to make sure the grammar is right. So I helped right. them with the grammar. Very simple to do, but they're extremely grateful. Yeah. I I go to France. They say you're staying with us. No question. Mm. Nice. We'll find a place for you. So it's it's you know it's that give and take, and that connection. Um, and the Internet has really helped a lot of people connect with different artists because the artists really have a very special place in this world to really, as I always see it, that art expresses society as society is reflected in art. And it's a love and hate kind of situation, even with films. I think a lot of people like the horror films because a lot of them are seeing their nightmares in a way mm-hmm. express, and it's their way of releasing that nightmare or the action they're bored with their life so they go to the movie and go to an action and it makes them feel like they're alive again Mm -hmm. through watching that film so i think art really has a positive aspect to help humans kind of deal with the day-to-day life i agree Um, and i and i I think that at the same because it has the potential to help and heal 
Mm -hmm. it also has the potential to damage and hurt. Of course. So we take we have to take w with great seriousness the responsibility uh, yes. of what we put out into the world. Yes, it's it's like um, there's a few f films that I've seen recently that I could so see it happening. Um, Opus is falling, I think is the name of it. I could so see that whole scenario happening. Mm -hmm. I can see somebody going, hey, that would be a great easy way to do it, and they laid it out exactly how to do it. So it's it's that balance of understanding the human mind, and these days there's a lot of twisted minds out there. Mm -hmm. So um, there is a great responsibility in art in all forms. Um, yeah. and, and a lot of things that happened, um, like Columbine, they're, they're saying the video games and music influence the actions of those kids. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it, there is some responsibility and you do need to understand that. Mm -hmm. So with everything that you're doing, is there anything right now that you're really focusing on to help artists? Is there an, a workshop that's coming up? Um, that people might be interested in? We haven't set our next workshop, uh, and I'm sorry I didn't get it set in time for this program, but right now we're actually having conversations with several different experts to figure out the, the next set of workshops we do so we can take the best people to um, share the very best information. Because when we do these workshops, we really try to we, tr we hyper curate it and really focus useful information. So I, I like to work with the people who are at the top of their game and also have that generosity of spirit of helping others. So we're in the process of figuring that out. So if people sign up on, um, to get onto my mailing list uh, at adamleipzig.com, they will get notified and they'll also get a discount coupon for the next workshop. Uh, I am. <clears throat> um, you know, I'm. I I am continually working with filmmakers and media people, in guiding them to help. You know, to make the right choices and assess their projects, assess the work that they're doing, assess whether the movies that they want to make are the right movies to make or the right creative media content to make, or, um, or for media companies or investors, I help them make the right investment decisions. I do this uh, through our company, Entertainment Media Partners, which is a significant focus of my work right now to help people really do things that will connect with audiences. Uh, you know, as I was saying earlier, 95% <clears throat> of the content that's created doesn't get any form of distribution. It's an incredible waste of money, time, talent, passion, emotion, expertise. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's one thing to to make something and then put it uh, put it for sale and have the audience reject it. That happens right. from time to time. But it's an entirely different thing to make something and not even be able to offer it to the audience. That's just terrible. <laughs> it's just, that's just that's bad creativity and bad business because it takes so long and, and so much effort to, to make any one of these projects. I'm very focused on helping to guide people and companies to assess their work and make wise decisions so their work can mm -hmm. really get out there and get seen. You know, one of the first questions I ask filmmakers when they come to me with a project is, who's your audience? If that question stops you cold, then you, you got, got to go back. <laughs> you got to go back and think about who are we doing this for. And if a filmmaker comes back and says, "You know, I don't really know if there's an audience for this, but this is just what I want to make," my feeling is I totally support you as an artist. And if that's what you want to do, mm -hmm. you should do it. It's not something I can particularly help you with because that's not my area of expertise. Uh, and as long as you can have the resources to do it, go do it. But if your purpose as an as an artist as creative per person is to reach and touch the lives of others, many others, in as powerful a way as possible, then you have to know who you're trying to reach and how they wish to be reached. That is for sure. Now, um, at least for independent filmmakers, there are more independent film festivals 
that are coming out and yeah. um, amazing films coming out from those. Um, so at least they have that avenue. And you did mention Netflix. Um, that is an option if they put it out there. And there is, you know, there's always YouTube. <laughs> I mean, they might not necessarily make money from it, but it is a way for the movie to be seen. It all yeah. depends on what their the goals are. Right. There's always YouTube. There's always Vimeo. There are probably now another two dozen companies that are offering online distribution in a variety of packages packages that I've begun to track starting at Sundance this year, Jennifer. Some of them uh, take a very reasonable distribution percentage and do all the hosting and take care of it for the filmmaker. Some people, um, uh, some other companies just charge a monthly servicing fee. Uh, so, uh, and, and even on YouTube and Vimeo now, you can do a pay-per-view model. Uh, I know that YouTube has it, and I think Vimeo is about to roll it out where you can put up your project, uh, your, your video content, on a pay-per-view model, set up how much you want to charge, and mm -hmm. complete those transactions. I think they charge a 30% fee, which is very reasonable for all the hosting and everything there. But then the filmmaker is faced with this problem that you just mentioned a moment ago, which is you got to have your audience. You need mm -hmm. to have your platform. You've got to bring the audience to the party because... None of these, these services will make it available, but they won't get people there. Uh, in, you know, one of the things that I learned early on when I was a, a kid in the movie business, I was at Walt Disney Studios and I was talking with the head of distribution. We were working on a movie and we were getting it out there. He bought a lot of television advertising. And I said, well, how's the movie going to do? He said, it's not going to open. I said, why isn't it going to open? You just spent $10 million buying TV ads. He said, well, I can buy the awareness. That's what I just did with the TV ads. I bought the awareness. People know about the movie. But I can't buy the want to see. And that's a big difference that we, that we always have. There are a lot of things that we're aware of, but there are few things that we actually want to invest our money or our time in experiencing, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of movies that opened last weekend. Um, most people didn't go to any of them. Some people went to one of them, and that was the one that had the biggest want to see. I think last weekend it was The Evil Dead mm -hmm. that had the biggest want to see. I think after that was uh, G.I. Joe 19 or whatever that was. Certainly a movie I didn't go see because yes. um, <laughs> I didn't have want to see for that, although I was aware of it. Agreed. So... Um, what is what is one way media social media is always a great way to start building your platform mm -hmm. is is there any other clues that you could give just little hints little tips um, that would help build that platform more solid um, any yeah, mistakes I, to avoid let's put it yeah, that I way have a lot, I have a lot of thoughts on this and some of these um, in fact many of these are by no means original to me they, uh, many of them are derived from experts that we've had on our seminars. So I'm, uh, you know, thank you, Laurie McNee, Kelly Koppel, um, uh, Moira Warshawski, and other people who have uh, been my teachers in this area. Uh, okay, yes, social media is a great way to build your platform. In fact, it's the, it is the way to build your platform right now. At the same time, don't forget the old-fashioned email list. Because while Twitter may get you a lot of followers and may reach out to hundreds of thousands or millions of people, you get less action than you do with a targeted email list of people who have signed up and said, yes, I actually want to get an email from you. So um, you should never forget your email list even while you're doing everything you want to do on social media. On social media, I believe that one size does not fit all. Not every social media engine is for everybody. Some people love Twitter. Some people hate it. If you hate it, don't do it. Uh, some people love Facebook. Some people don't. If you don't hate it, don't do it. But find something that can be your primary form of expression, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or Tumblr or Pinterest 
or anything or LinkedIn or anything else where you can really build a following. And it's generally good to have a presence in a few of them, even though mm -hmm. one of them may be the one where you feel the greatest sense of comfort. Once you get into social media, don't expect instant results. I think it takes a couple of years to build a good platform. One of the things that I say in the workshops to the creative people and filmmakers uh, and investors that I train is that if you're going to have a project done in a couple of years, which would be the timeline if you're starting uh, if you're starting pre-production of the movie right now, it might be a couple of years before it actually hits audiences. Start your social media audience building platform before you start your location scouting. Start it at the very beginning. Involve the audience in everything you're doing along the way. People love to know about the creative process and the work behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. That will help you build your audience to the point where they will be there for you when your project is ready for them. Uh, let's see. What else can I suggest? I also think that um, social media should be... 80 to 90 percent good information and service, and only 10 to 20 percent telling people uh, to buy your stuff. People whose uh, whose feeds are all about buy my book, buy my workshop, mm -hmm. do this, do that. You know, come to this weekend retreat for three thousand dollars. All that, all that stuff. If that's all they're doing, we turn off really fast because we don't want to be sold to. Mm -hmm. So um, figure out who your audience is. Figure out what they need. How can you serve them? Make sure that you're serving them with 80 to 90 percent of your posts with great information, uh, great tips, um, great referrals. And then they will be there for you when you also tell them about the things that you're working on. Those are a few of the suggestions I would make in terms of social media. Um for something that it's like I have a few blogs mm -hmm. and each one has a different voice because mm. writing I do I do different voices it's kind of strange um, but each one has a little bit of a different voice like my mm -hmm. poetry is different than my reflections and my reflection is different than I can't even remember the other ones that I have um, mm -hmm. but I think that a blog builds up an audience plus if you have more audience with a certain voice, mm -hmm. then you know that's the way to focus your books. What a great point! Yeah, I completely agree. Um, and and which it, which, of, which of your blogs do you does of, of the blogs that you do, Jennifer? Where does your audience most listen to your voice? Actually, um, I've been a guest blogger, uh, writer on a few sites. That's where I post my audience because there's already a built-in audience. And I'm right. part of um, a, a site called Rebel Society. Mm -hmm. And I think I get most of my audience in that, which is more of a very passionate, sensual voice um, yeah. than some of the other writings that I do. Like... Jennifer Hellman Reflection is more of the life coaching which I do. It's going mm -hmm. through the process and understanding both sides of the perspective of the situation and, and kind of delving into a situation in that sense, which gets some reaction. But I think more people feel that my soul is in my writing from, like, the Rebel Society, that mm -hmm. essence. Um, and then also I get a good response to my poetry, Right. Which is a little bit more like the, the side of the rebel, shall we say. Um, nice. But I, as a writer, I, I really felt I needed to find different voices. Mm -hmm. Like, it's almost like writing a character. You find that voice of that character through writing the backstory. Right. So um, I enjoy doing it. Um, mm -hmm. And, and it makes it more fun with writing instead of always doing the same thing. It's like the writers that have more than one pin name because that way they can do mm -hmm. a different voice and a different style, and it's not going to hurt the other. Right. I understand. So, um, but I, I've just found that it's it's a good way to really 
find which audience is the stronger one for you. Right. And knowing who your audience is is, is, is so, is so crucial for any creative person. Um, cause that, that then really builds your, your fan base and the people who will support you in, in yes. your work and really appreciate your work. Yes. And it was just writing a few pieces actually on Facebook that I got asked to do some blogging, some articles for other places. And mm-hmm. then that started. So it's, it's being willing to be vulnerable and just put that piece out there. And that's another thing that, um, is a big part of being an artist is being vulnerable and showing that part of you out there and understanding you'll be okay. You might get rejected, but it's, it's a very tender process in doing any kind of creativity. I like that word tender. It's a, it's a good descriptor for the creative process. Um, so it's, it's great. Um, to be an artist and to say I'm an artist. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I've deviled in a lot. I've got a degree in graphic design and I've done painting and I've done sculpture and then poetry and writing So um, and photography. And it's it's I'm doing collaborative things with some photography where it's their photography and then I write a story that I'm getting from the photography. Right. So we're doing collaborative things like that, which is a lot of fun. So, and I do think that's a lot of the energy that's going out there now is the collaboration and being able to understand the different genres. you got to be very diverse this these years, this time, and creative. You, you can't just say, I'm an artist and I'm just a writer and that's it. You really need to stretch out, don't you think? I do. Uh, and I think the, especially as technology makes it, easier for so many of us to do things that we never thought possible before you have to keep learning and retraining and recrafting what you do to um to you know to to meet the audience's needs um you know and i've I've actually found myself i'm doing stuff i never thought i could do by myself before uh uh, you know a couple years ago uh, if people said do this in html i would have said please i don't have any idea how to do that and now i just do that every day and it's it's not really a big deal uh the ability you know in the in the film business the ability to create to shoot edit mix do sound recording all on a laptop and with an iphone is extraordinary now and we all have that yeah Uh, you know it's all in our power right now so um, filmmakers, please don't tell me you need the equipment or you, you don't have the resources to go make a movie. Fifteen-year-olds are making movies, and they look really good. So just go out and do it. Uh, it's even younger even. You never – it's it's yeah, amazing that – Five-year-olds, that's right. I mean, it's amazing that you can learn a lot from watching young people create. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's another – do you think having a mentor – in the field is good or bad? Well, it can't be bad, but does it really help you to have somebody who's been in the industry to just kind of brain, you know, kind of doing some? I think mentors are great. Uh, I've had, I've had a couple of terrific mentors in my career who um, didn't even know that they were my mentors, but they were my mentors. The thing about having a mentor is that they help you navigate away from the um, uh, f- from the blind alleys and the cul-de-sacs and mm-hmm. just and are, they're just really good sounding boards because they've done it so many times I had two great mentors one uh, is a legendary film executive named Jeffrey Katzenberg who was uh, running Disney um, with Michael Eisner when I was at Disney and when we were part of the uh, that very first team reinventing the studio in the uh, 1980s and 1990s. Um, you know, Jeffrey did, probably doesn't know he was my mentor. Didn't we never we never said we have a mentor mentee relationship? But he gave right. me my graduate education in the movie business. Uh, I learned so much from him about how to make choices, how to run a studio, how to respect creativity, how to appreciate 
talent, how to decide what resources are well or not well spent. And then my most recent mentor uh, passed away about uh, six months ago. He's a great producer named Jake Eberts. Jake produced mm. Chariots of Fire and Gandhi and Dances with Wolves and Chicken Run and probably 70 other movies. Uh, he was a, a, a great man who uh, taught me a great deal uh, over the uh, past decade, uh, and I miss him a lot. And, uh, uh, you know, again, we never had a... Um, we never had a relationship where he said, I'm sure, but uh, uh, he was. Yeah. And I'm, I'm a great believer in, in having having the right mentor is a great thing. And I'm sorry for your love. He has an amazing body of work. And I yeah. can just imagine that he was quite the teacher. Um, there are some of those people that you're just around and they naturally teach without even realizing what they're giving to you because mm -hmm. they're just so giving. And I can imagine both these men just naturally being that way. Yeah. Um, so it's like some of the, the greatest lessons that people can have is just listening and watching and paying attention to the people that they're with and around them. And you can learn so much without even knowing exactly what you're learning. You kind of absorb the energy. Um, yeah. And sometimes being in, the, you, being in that place is a good thing. Yes, yes. So, with everything that you're doing, is there what is your goals um, coming up? I mean, is there anything that you really feel like you want to achieve for yourself that you haven't yet? Uh, Jennifer, I'm not terribly ambitious for myself, but I am incredibly ambitious for the world. I, <laughs> I am so ambitious for this world to be a better, freer, more generous, loving, creative, interesting, fair, and just place. So all the work that I do is directed towards that by working with artists and creative people who I believe are prophets, who create forms for a society that we wish to achieve. Um, mm -hmm. I find that very fulfilling. And if I can help um, more creative people make more, better creative work, I'll feel as though I've done my job well. Um, very admirable and most needed. And I appreciate it, like I said at the beginning. Um, looking over videos in your website, and Cultural Weekly, it's just like your body of work um, is it's helpful to everyone who looks. It's like I was just watching your videos that you put there just for the simple processes in the film and, mm -hmm. and little things. And it's just I know it's going to make a big difference. Um, I was just watching one of them that you were talking to a group about actually the changes you would like to see in supporting the, the artist and it's just like I just kind of went wow um, amazing and it's it's very reassuring to have somebody at your caliber that really cares about the creative process um, so it's, it's just beautiful to have you on and we have only about a few minutes left. Is there any final words or wisdom you would like to share in the last five minutes of the? Oh, of I don't the... know if I have. I don't know if I have any wisdom, but thank you so much for those those complimentary things you said. You know, some videos you may have been thinking about are a series that I started doing when we launched the book at the end of January. This book, Inside Track for Independent Filmmakers, and we call the video series Ask Adam where every week or so I post a two-minute answer to questions that people have uh, have sent in, uh, you know, questions about what do I do if I get into a film festival or how long should my screenplay be or, you know, there's things that seem, um, seem basic, 
uh, may be embarrassing to ask in a room because you feel like, boy, I should know the answer to that already. But the, the most basic questions are often the best questions because they're the ones that form a good foundation for our future work. So I've been doing those, and those are those are great fun. And uh, we've had lots of people uh, come in and watch those and enjoy them. I invite uh, all of your listeners uh, to come on over to my website, adamleipzig.com, A-D-A-M, L-E-I-P-Z-I-G dot com. There is a lot of free content, and you'll also get very occasional emails when we do have special workshops and seminars so you know about them. I promise you your inbox will not get flooded. Um, I never sell or share people's um, email addresses. Uh, we hold that with very high standards and security. And also, come on over and check out Cultural Weekly. Mm-hmm. Dot com, the, the digital magazine that we talked about a little bit, Jennifer. We have, um, I think we have some really terrific content and a terrific, engaged, creative audience, which is about 85% in the U.S., about 15% international. Um, thousands and thousands and thousands of people every week are reading and sharing that digital magazine, uh, uh, which is uh, terrific. It's a, uh, it's a really terrific, creative supportive community. Uh, this week we're going to be, um, let's see, we have a terrific poem by Gerald Laughlin. We have a, um, a letter from New Zealand uh, uh, about from, from someone who was an, uh, an anchor woman at, uh, uh, at a CBS affiliate in Sacramento who's now in New Zealand who's been sharing her cultural experiences outside of the United States. Uh, an article and a video about a creative salon that takes place in Los Angeles. And I'm writing a piece that deconstructs a McDonald's commercial and looks at the imagery in that commercial and how it has, uh, 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 you know, how, how that commercial imagery works and how it takes some aspects of very, very low culture and applies them to this McDonald's food commercial. So we, we have a lot of interesting stuff on there. And also um, a little tribute to Roger Ebert, who was, uh, who was a great friend and a great enthusiastic lover of cinema, who mm-hmm. passed away last week. Uh, yes, he was. As they've been saying in a lot of the interviews, he really brought uh, movie criticism to the forefront and gave people, um, I think, a greater appreciation for film through mm-hmm. his work. Him and Cisco, both of them were wonderful to get those different kinds of things. So, one second, I believe we have a call. Oh, okay. Um, with that, we are going to say thank you, Adam, again. Um, I, I appreciate your work, as I said, and I. Um, wish you all the very best. I definitely am going to keep in touch with what your work is doing and definitely um, thank you for everything that you're doing. Um, it's been an honor and a blessing. So with that, I say thank you very much. Jennifer, thank you so much. It's been a great, great pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you. Um, and with that, this is WolfSpiritRadio.com. We are a listening-based support operation. So if you like this program, please donate. And we're going to take a short break, and we'll be back in a few. This is Jennifer Hillman on air, Abstract Illusions Radio. Take care. You're listening to Wolf Spirit Radio. Radio. 